<laughs> okay, right, okay. So um, this opening slide just shows um, one, of, one of our <laughs> entries. We don't use this one anymore, but it has rather a nice view uh, looking south across the mountains of Snowdonia and Snowdon itself is off to the uh, left-hand side. Um, this, uh, this A3 was good in many ways, but just too windy. So we abandoned it some years ago, but it makes a nice picture. Right, so my um, initial reaction to this giving this talk was reluctance because we, we're only two years and nine months into our non-treatment experiment. So I don't feel that I know an awful lot about it. However, uh, when I had an exchange of emails with Jerry, uh, he persuaded me that I might have something to useful to say. So uh, I hope that when I finish, you'll think so. So first of all, um, he encouraged me also to use this subtitle, which I'd mentioned in an email to him, uh, uh, which is uh, Natural Selection Never Sleeps. And this comes from an American product uh, called Rust-Oleum, which says Rust Never Sleeps. And I came across this because I'm quite a fan of Neil Young music and uh, one of his albums is called Rust. Uh, that's how I came to that. So first of all, we'll give you a little bit of background, show you where we are. That's where Anglesey is, by the way, the red circle there. Um, and that, this, is, this is Wales here and this is Anglesey here. And it, Jerry was saying, how far is it offshore? At the narrowest, it's about 100 metres. And it's a, a deep, fast-flowing channel between the two islands. It, but it's not really a, a separation. There are two bridges crossing, a, a, a rail and road bridge and a, um, just a road bridge. Down here, you notice I've also got um, an island uh, um, mark, which is the Isle of Wight. And I, that, that's there because I have to be talking about that in a minute. So that's, that's Anglesey itself now, and um, this is where we live down here. This is, this is where we're in this circle here. So we're down in the southwest corner, and this is the open sea out here. And if you go down here in a southwesterly direction, far enough, you reach the Gulf of Mexico. So it's really quite an exposed coastline, this. Um, um, Anglesey is a, a name that derives from uh, as Norse origins, and, and Inisman is the Welsh name for it. And Holy Island is where the, the, the ferry goes to Southern Ireland. Right, the environment is uh, wet and windy. We have about 42 inches of rain a year here. And as I said, the prevailing winds from the southwest. Um, land use is mostly grazing. Uh, some of it around us is starting to be improved now. It was rough grazing before, uh, and this improved grazing with fertilizer use is not as good. And the Welsh have this funny system of inheritance, which is different probably from you and from, certainly from England, is that um, the assets, on death, the assets are divided equally between the sons. So what we what they end up with is long strip fields, and we are actually set in a system of strip fields, and we are not allowed to change any of the boundaries. They're considered to be of historical importance. Uh, we've got little intensive farming, and the fields are mostly bounded by stone walls and hedges. Um, um, uh, we don't have much woodland on the island, um, but we do have good flower forage, but uh, our potential for honey production is limited by weather. So we have no real commercial uh, beekeeping on the island, although we've got a couple of people who pretend they are, so we don't really have uh, the problems you have with that. Uh, uh, we moved here in 1978, and we have two acres of land, so I presume, listening to your discussion earlier, we could have 20 hives on it. Um, we, the first thing we did when we got here is we created a large vegetable garden, uh, uh, and then the following year we started to plant an orchard. We were interested in vegetable garden and orchard originally. And, um, 
after a few years, we actually had 50 different varieties of apple in our orchard. There's a tremendous richness of apples in, in Great Britain. And we actually have a, a national collection of apples, which has over 2,000 distinct varieties in it. Um, and about seven years later, we were, we were getting a lot of flour, but not much fruit. So we speculated that pollination might be a problem. I don't actually think it was. And we met a local beekeeper through our kids and we invited him to put a hive in our orchard. He, like beekeepers do, just jumped at this opportunity. But um, the following year, he, he came and went and we didn't take much notice of him. He wasn't a very active beekeeper. Um, he never offers a jar of honey, by the way. Um, uh, uh, a year later, he came to us and said, well, I am moving away and I can't take all my hives. Would you like to have this hive? So, OK, we said, uh, well, what could be so difficult about that? So we, that's how we came to take up beekeeping. And this is us with actually a picture of us in 1987 with our first hive and um, uh, some rather make makeshift protective equipment, which we, which we found to our cost. Um, Initially, we made pretty slow progress um, in beekeeping. We joined our local beekeeping association, but uh, they didn't run courses at the time. But we fortunately had some help from a mentor in the next village. Um, and we got mixed and sometimes very confusing advice from other beekeepers. You know what, you know what it's like, they tell you one thing one day, they all got different ideas. The beekeeping books in Britain at the time were not really very ex accessible for beginners. We, had, we were recommended a book which it has everything in it that you'd want to know, but the que when you're a new beekeeper, you don't even know what you need to know, so it was very difficult to use. Since then, uh, some very good bee co beekeeping books for beginners have come onto the market, and it is easier. We're both retired ecologists, so we thought probably the best idea was to find a bit more about bee biology. So the real, the real banker was uh, Honey Bee Biology by Mark Winston. And later, um, I had a copy of Seeley's Wisdom of the Hive, which I also found very insightful. Um, uh, we also have a, a, a local author who's not known by any, he's hardly known by anybody in this country, but he was actually the editor of um, Beecraft for about 25 years. And he wrote a couple of books during the, during the Second World War while he was actually on sort of a uh, fire duty during the air raids. He actually wrote it while he was sitting around waiting for something to happen. And he was... A, a man well ahead of his time. He, he had a, a, a very interesting philosophy about beekeeping, which required you uh, to understand the bees was the most important thing. Uh, we're now beginning to get some idea about what we're dealing with. Um, I'm just going to go on the side now to show how history finally repeats itself. Anglesey beekeepers it's ABKA, was established in 1925. And their mission statement, I mean, that phrase hadn't been invented in those days, their aim was to help beekeepers restock after heavy, heavy, heavy colony losses due to uh, Isle of Wight disease. Now, you may, uh, you may or may not have ever heard of Isle of Wight disease, but it was a, the outbreak started on the Isle of Wight in in 1906 and is said to have quickly spread to most of the UK and caused heavy colony losses. Even in those days there was massive media hype about this and just like your CCD has uh, produced. Um, at the time nobody had any idea what the cause of this disease was. Um, uh, uh, what um, 13 years later, the tracheal mite was, was first identified and that was given the blame for this disease. Although with the benefit of hindsight and greater knowledge about bee diseases, 
uh, there's little evidence that uh, this was true. And it is now thought by Les Bailey, our, our famous uh, bee pathologist, that it was actually one of the uh, bee paralysis viruses that was the main cause. And for years after this, all colony losses tended to be blamed uh, on Isle of Wight disease. And I think, again, this paralyzes, it parallels your CCD. Um, I went to a talk by David Tarpey, and he reckoned that about 4% of colony losses could be attributed, had symptoms that could attribute it to CCD, whatever that was. We think that the late Victorian beekeepers were the to the blame for this disease because it became very fashionable to have imported queens and say, oh, I've got an Italian queen or a Caucasian queen or whatever. And they probably did what we're doing today. It was the start of globalization, if you like. Um, we think probably they're to blame. Um, it was at the time it was claimed that it caused our native bee, which is the uh, northern dark bee, Apis mellifera mellifera, to become extinct. Uh, extinct. But um, this is a bit like Mark Twain seeing his uh, uh, obituary in a newspaper and remarking that it was somewhat exaggerated. Uh, by the start of the Second World War, 1940, Isle of Wight disease had effectively disappeared but it continued to be blamed for all the losses, of course. And we're, we're pretty, recovery can only have really been through natural selection. And it was the great fortune at the time that there were literally no medicines around. And this is how natural selection uh, happened in a comparatively few years. People did try to medicate for this disease and there were all sorts of incredible ideas uh, 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 around and the, the, one of the first ones was that uh, you should uh, it was pollen that was the problem and that you should remove all pollen stores before the winter can you imagine they tried things like phenyl formalin uh, a disinfectant called isle sour milk salt and we had this famous thing that some of the old beekeepers are still banging on about, which was called Frau Mixture. And this was uh, invented by a, um, um, a sort of fairly small time industrial chemist. Uh, and it was a mixture of petrol, you didn't say whether it's leaded petrol or not, uh, saffron oil. And if you know anything about these things, saffron oil can be used as a uh, a, a precursor for making ecstasy and uh, nitrobenzene, which can be used as an explosive. And this continued to be sold uh, by bee suppliers up until the 1960s. Uh, and I think if you tried to source the ingredients now, you'd probably get investigated by the police. Uh, there was some use of a substance called oil of wintergreen which is methyl salicylate. Uh, how different it is today, we, we, we always, th at first, the first resort is always, have we got a medicine for it? And it's true both of human disease and bee disease. So anyhow, to get back to the main theme, we started with one hive, um, and this was a build up to an obsession, if you like, uh, and 15 years later, we were up to 50. Um, we started with one apiary and, and gradually worked up to six. Uh, in 2011, we set up an association teaching apiary. I'll say a bit more about that later. So we're now managing um, seven apiaries. Uh, we was, we, my wife and I started beekeeping courses and our aim was to supply all new beekeepers with a nuke uh, of what we call locally adapted bee. That's Anglesey bee. We don't want bees from elsewhere. We've got a, a very peculiar climate on Anglesey and our local bees uh, know exactly how to deal with it. So we started to make 30 to 40 nukes a year. This means in the middle of the summer, we were often managing up to 100 colonies. In all this time, we have never, ever purchased a queen. 
Uh, now, with advancing age, we're starting to downsize a bit, very sensibly, I think. Uh, the main impetus has always been interest in bees. Um, honey production, yeah, we know that beekeeping is about honey production, so we want to use methods in bees that can produce a crop of honey. So this is this is a um, picture of our bottom of our orchard, which is um, uh, these are some of our production hives, as you like. And this is uh, in the spring, and you'll notice that uh, we've actually got insulation on top of the hive here. We have we have open mesh floors, which are left open the year round, and we have in the winter we have insulated uh, cover boards or or top boards to you, I guess. Uh, this is our mating nukes in our home apiary. We can have up to about 20 uh, five frame nukes here, uh, which have got uh, queen cells in them and we're, we're expecting mating. Our home apiary um, is a very, seems to be a very successful place for getting bees mated. We've often had 100% success here with you know, up to 20 nukes. Um, and we know we know there are feral bees in the vicinity. We don't know exact. We have known where some were, but we we because land is private, we can't really sort of track them down. But we know there are feral colonies in the area. And that's uh, that's one of our out apiaries, one of our more successful out apiaries, which has um, some very good forage and usually usually is produces us the highest crop that we get. And this again is a picture in June. This is after the spring flow and before the, uh, the, the summer flow comes on. Um, Varroa arrived in, in the UK in uh, 1992, but when it was found, it had probably been present there for a couple of years, um, despite any restrictions on movement. It, it got to Anglesey in 1996. And for us, it was in all our colonies by uh, 1998. Um, in the first four years, uh, we used pyrethroid strips, which had just become available in this country at that time, uh, either Bavera or Apistan. But we realized that resistance was going to develop. In fact, it developed a lot quicker than we ever thought it would. And from 2002 on, we've relied entirely on thymol in the form of Apigard uh, and oxalic acid trickle to control Varroa. And it's interesting that early in the 90s, I can't remember which year it was exactly, I attended um, uh, a symposium, I think it was entitled Fight the Mice or something like that, where it was confidently predicted that uh, uh, bee breeding would uh, was in progress and would fairly soon solve the problem. And after 30 years, uh, it has failed to produce uh, resistant bees. So I think anybody who was interested in biology had known for a long time that natural resistance uh, was the, would be the way forward. Uh, and it was, you know, assumed that natural selection would solve the problem eventually, but nobody had any idea what, how long eventually was, whether it was 10 years, 100 years, 1,000 years. Uh, and uh, most people obviously decided to treat, uh, there were sort of huge losses in this country, by the way, initially, because people didn't know how to treat them. People, there were people who lost uh, all their hives as a result of this. Um, so the idea was that um, we would use treatments until bee breeding solved the problem. And I'm sure you're aware of this, but all forms of treatment are, have just exactly the same effect on natural selection. It doesn't matter how, whether you use Kumafos or whether you use um, biological controls of Varroa, like uh, uh, caging the queen or something like that. They all have exactly the same restrictive effect on natural selection because in doing so, you are preventing a hive that would otherwise have died from dying. And that's what you've got to avoid doing if you're going to have natural selection work for you. 
And it was mooted that um, failure to control the mite could even lead to the extinction of the honeybee. And there were various scare stories like that going around. And also how would it affect honey production and pollination? Not that we actually produce very much of our own honey in this country anyway. Um, you know, it was even predicted that the world as we know it would come to the end if we didn't control Varroa. So the result, virtually all beekeepers uh, uh, chose to treat their colonies. However, we've always felt there were hopeful signs. A lot of people claim that feral colonies have been come, become extinct. And I don't think it was, uh, it was, certainly wasn't true on Anglesey. And I was uh, good friends with a beekeeper in the south of England. And it certainly wasn't true in his area. But what it was difficult to do was to establish the longevity of these feral colonies. How many years did they survive? Were they refreshed each year by beekeepers losing swarms? And this is something we didn't know. There were always anecdotal reports of sites having been in occupation for several years, um, but you never quite knew. And quite early on, we started to collect colonies for which there was some evidence of survival for several years. And we also were able to, re got called in to, to take bees out of places, and we were able to recover some colonies from feral nests. Um, here's one that we did, which is in uh, um, well, a local mansion, I think you might call it, which was being re-roofed. And they, the, the roofers actually found this during the winter but it was quite a big place, so they were able to wait to the spring when they put the scaffolding up around this part of the house. And um, we were able to go up there while they took the slates off and um, recover this colony. And there was a really extensive nest under this, uh, what we call a pediment. Uh, um, and I guess there was Two thirds of the comb was unoccupied there, but obviously there'd been bees there for many, many years, but whether it was the same bees or not, I, um, you know, it was impossible to establish. And here's another one we did. This was a shed where there was actually a, we've taken off um, a wooden covering there. And then the other side is um, uh, some corrugated asbestos. And that is a colony, it's just two, two, two um, combs th uh, wide, and it's, it's about a, a bit over a square meter in area. And um, we managed to, managed to dissect this out and recover the queen. And uh, we had a hive just outside here. The actual entrance for this was just under the windowsill here. We had a hive outside and once we got the queen in there, we left it there for a bit and all the bees came out and we were able to take this comb down. One of the interesting things we found, this, we had quite a lot of drone brood in here and decided to in investigate some of it. And about one in 10 cells had um, a mite in, but in no cases that we could find did the mite seem to have bred. There were no offspring there. Um, and we've seen this on a number of occasions with, with bees, that there are mites in drone cells and they appear to have not, not bred. And what that's about, I've no idea. So we had read about um, uh, Inga Marfrisi's uh, uh, Bond experiment, Live or Let Die. And... Um, we started to plan our own experiment in 2008 and uh, we made a case for it and uh, put that to our umbrella association, the Welsh, Welsh Beekeepers Association, and they agreed that uh, they would finance the equipment, the hive, so they gave, they gave us the money for uh, 20 hives, which I duly assembled all, all the kit and uh, I'd also located what at that time regarded as a suitable site to do this which was um, a fairly isolated area uh, in in the middle of Anglesey. Uh, it's a low-lying area 
uh, with, with a sort of marsh on it. And uh, you can find isolated areas in the mountains, but they are not places where bees can sustain themselves the year round. You can move bees there in summer and they do okay, but they can't sustain themselves the year round. Well, this was an area where we reckon that the colonies would be fairly self-sufficient. And at that time, we started collecting some promising colonies to, to, to populate this with. However, we got involved in other distractions. Um, uh, we had, from our hive records, we realized um, we were losing colonies each winter. And when we looked at our hive records, we discovered that these were nearly all colonies that had queens who were experiencing their first winter. And that once they had got through their first winter safely, our queens went on to live for three, four years. And we recently had a queen who just made it over into her sixth year. And um, by, the hypothesis was that um, que the experts said, we inquired with people who are experts in disease, and they reckoned that um, queen bees did not host viruses. So we thought that probably a virus was involved. So the first thing we wanted to know was, could viruses actually uh, attack queens and um, we got some of these queens that were dysfunctional some of ours another beekeeper cooperated with us and we got some more from him and um, we sent them off to our national bee unit where they were screened for viruses and uh, most of them turned out to have quite a high titer of deformed wing virus in them so we now knew that they could in get infected. But how did they get infected? Why didn't older queens get infected? And from this, we formed the hypothesis that uh, they were actually, the, because in a, in a colony of bees, a queen will inevitably get fed by nurse bees who are carrying deformed wing virus, but they don't seem to get the disease that way. So we deduced that probably the most likely source of the infection was uh, during mating. It was known that drones um, had uh, virus particles in their semen and um, there, there might be some human parallels here that uh, their actual reproductive tract was poorly immunologically protected whereas their digestive system was. Um, so we, we, we did some experiments for, for, to establish this, some preliminary experiments to establish this with our national bee unit in, in which we, we were set to raise 20 nukes and what we did was we, uh, just before the queens emerged, we harvested uh, a queen from the cell and then left the nuke to go on and requeen itself. And when the, when, the, when the queen who took over this nuke um, was mated, we, we sampled her to see whether uh, she had got infected during her mating process. And yes, some of them had. Um, uh, at that time, this research that they were, they were uh, overtaking, research had already started on this in Europe. And since then, new, several papers have been published showing that um, uh, queens get infected by this route by, uh, as a sexually transmitted disease. And it changed our strategy for queen mating because what we also discovered from our hive records, that if queens were mated early in the year, and by, uh, we can't, we, with our climate, we can't really get queens for mating until the beginning of June. So if we could get them mated in June, they were much more likely to survive. They were less likely to meet up with a drone that was carrying a deformed wing virus early in the season. But as we got later and later in the season, the probability of, of them picking up uh, a virus became increased. So we make all the efforts to get our queens 
uh, mated in June. Uh, from July on, um, so it happens that colonies do requeen themselves later, but we always regard them with some suspicion. All this business took time and effort, which prevented us getting this started, this uh, uh, bond experiment started. Uh, then in 2011, um, you're probably aware that um, uh, there was a big thing about small cell beekeeping and how wonderful it was. And, and I'm not sure, wasn't completely convinced, and I wasn't sure whether it ought to be incorporated in, in this uh, bond experiment. So that was something more to think about. We also became aware that both Ingemar Fries and uh, Tom Seeley's Arnott Forest Bees seem to rely on small colony size and annual swarming as the basis of their resistance. And these were clearly not um, uh, beekeeper colonies. Uh, and uh, that was a little bit of a disincentive. Um, I mean, it helped the survival of the bees, but it, it it wasn't going to do much uh, for beekeeping. Also, this was the time when there was a tremendous upsurge of interest in beekeeping in Great Britain. And uh, we, were, we had to start beekeeping courses. We, my wife and I had been sort of mentoring beekeepers for a number of years, um, but uh, doing this on an individual basis was not the good use uh -huh. of time. So we, started our course and in the last 10 years our association membership has risen from 45 to about 150 and we do a very practical form of uh, beekeeping training which is hands-on people actually get their own hands on hives we only just demonstrate initially how to examine a hive after that they they get one of these hives in our training a free to look at uh, for themselves uh, with, with somebody looking on and, and guiding them and this we had to set up a, co uh, a training apiary which had 12, 12 teaching colonies of bees in and these poor colonies often get open two or three times a week they don't seem to worry too much um, and the equipment that we had been funded by WVKA. We repaid that money and diverted this equipment uh, into this training apiary. Uh, with hindsight, I regret not having persevered at the time, but there we are. Now, uh, the reason we started to make all these nukes is that we had a, have a long tradition on Anglesey of using locally adapted bees, and it's a sort of it's an un, uh, almost a, it's an unwritten rule in the association that you don't buy in bees. I and mean, we've had some people who have flouted this. Uh, at, uh, almost invariably, they're very poor beekeepers, and the bees that they imported don't survive. We had a beekeeper import uh, some New Zealand Italian queens, but the following year, the, there wasn't a sign in the apiary that he'd. Uh, ever existed that they these 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 queens had ever existed they just disappeared entirely um we're now being able to doubt people we've taught to beekeep and taught to make queens for themselves are now starting to take over the nuke making business um and that's taking in quite a, a load of us so we're making making um nukes mostly for ourselves and as reserves uh, in, in future years. Um, meanwhile, in North Wales, a number of beekeepers um, were starting uh, to run non-treatment colonies. The motivation for this um, was not quite clear. It, it came through people who were bitterly opposed to using chemicals of any sort. Uh, and they started to report that they were getting uh, resistant colonies, but um, they chose to, I won't explain it, but they chose to produce the evidence for this in a very peculiar way, which is the scientist was really open to interpretation. Um, so uh, 
talking to them, some of them, I was fairly sure that they were actually on to something and they genuinely had got resistant bees. And th this was seen as uh, it's very encouraging. So now if we go forward to the spring of uh, 2018, uh, we started to get some, um, they started at long last in Europe, there were our places where they had resistant colonies and these were uh, in actual production apiaries. So these were colonies that were expected to produce a crop of honey and um, they, it started to be studied and um, along came this discovery of this uncapping and recapping behavior, which was thought to be the root of this uh, resistance. Um, I'll talk a bit more about this, this, this cap uncapping and recapping behavior later. When I've got over, I'm initially going to say what we've done and then I'm going to discuss uh, uh, row resistance it, it, it more, in a more wide, wider context. So that winter we decided to dedicate one of our apiaries to non-treatment and we had got an apiary about three miles distance from us where we had been collecting some of these colonies that we thought had possibly had some pedigree, some reason to suppose that they'd survived in the wild or their, uh, the, the, their previous colonies had done, some of them were were um, you know derived from colonists that we thought were probably had had a feral lifestyle, and this was quite a small thing because um, our original experiment was to tend to start with twenty colonies and to have them in small groups with a spatial separation of about fifty meters. We had a huge site available to us, but starting in our own apiaries in a small way, we were unable to do this. So this is actually the apiary that we are using. As you can see, it's just a small fenced area uh, uh, in a, the edge of a field with woodland backing it, right? This isn't actually when it's been turned, this is actually taken before it was turned into a non-treatment apiary. But that shows you the sort of situation we're dealing with. Now this I think is, this is what I really came offered to give the talk for because I thought it might be useful. Um, we, we decided on a protocol uh, for what we do with our non-treatment apiary. Uh, and um, I'm sure you already know this, but if you're going to do non-treatment, I think you have to be sensible and uh, do it in an area where you're unlikely to affect other beekeepers. In other words, when, if, when colonies die, they will not unload their mites on somebody else. So that is a sort of requirement. And we have, we, the apiaries we have here in the next village are like this. There's nobody else really within range who's likely to be affected by what we're doing. So obviously the first item in this protocol, uh, no method of rower control to be used. Absolutely nothing, nothing that would, that would help the colony survive. Uh, of rower would be ever done to these colonies. But to, uh, to, to deal with this, this hive spacing business, um, colonies that are about to fail will be removed uh, to prevent the sort of domino effect or mite bombs that are sometimes called. Uh, otherwise, we're going to manage these colonies as normal production colonies and would expect them to produce a crop, crop of honey for us, which they have done. Uh, there would be regular inspection uh, to monitor, monitor the progress and uh, how the bees were doing. So again, we would treat them just like normal production colonies and look for all the normal things that we would like, like swarm cells and the queen got enough space to lay. We do all, all those normal things as we would with our normal production colonies. And the advantage is the, you, the, the, the fact that we will get rid of colonies that are going to not survive before they actually collapse entirely is, is if you like, a sort of um, it's natural selection, but beekeeper aided. You're getting rid of these colonies that aren't going to survive and you, get, you must get them, rid of them altogether. They mustn't be allowed to 
uh, you mustn't treat them and allow them to survive and produce drones. They've either got to be killed or taken elsewhere a long way away, one or the other. Now we do regular inspections and that's every seven to 10 days during the main season of July and at other times of the year um, as necessary. A question, on the, a question for you. Can I ask a question? Uh, yes, do. Yes, yeah, okay. um, I was just wondering if um, killing the queen for the, the colonies that are not doing well and requeening from one of the other colonies might be an alternative. What did you think about that? It, uh, Yes, it would be, except you, you, you're presenting that queen. If you if retain any of the brood, you are, you are in a sense, giving that new queen a, uh, uh, you know, something they've got to deal with. Um, we, we have what we, we have, we've got, in the past, we've had colonies that are almost certainly going to die. And what we would do with those is we would take away all frames containing brood, regardless, and then treat them. And this taking, removing all frames of the dead bees they contain and the mites they contain and the virus they contain breaks the cycle and those colonies almost invariably survive then. So we wouldn't want to do this really. Um, we're also, we, uh, we don't really do requeening in the normal sense of the word because um, all, all our swarm control management, uh, we do it in such a way that we allow the colony to have a choice of a new queen. We never leave, if occasionally it's not, it's not possible, but we never leave a colony with just one queen cell that we have chosen. We leave them always with a number of queen cells and let them make the choice of a new queen. Um, and okay. it's, 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 it, we, we think this is quite important, although we've got no actual proof that it is. You could, you could answer your question? Hmm? Well, yeah, I mean, alternatives, which we pro I probably should let you go on, but would be just put in a frame of eggs and young brood from a successful colony e after you've killed that queen and maybe treated with formic or something. Yes, yes. We, um, we don't shoot, we, in this apiary, we, 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 we tend to go as clear, as close to real natural selection as possible. I mean, the co uh, our com we've actually got such a colony at the minute, and I, I will tell you about that later on in the talk, right? Okay. Okay. I just, I just finished dealing with um, the way we have set up our non-treatment apiary. Um, and dur during these inspections, we're obviously looking for mites r on bees and running on combs. But by the time you see that uh, or easily, a uh, colony is usually in fairly dire straits anyway. Um, we're looking for bees with deformed wings. These are the actual symptomatic bees. Uh, and we're looking for also for undersized bees, which are the result of having a high varroa population because they're simply malnourished by the feeding activities of the mite. But most of all, we're looking for signs of parasitic mite syndrome. I think you use this terminology. Do you? We do. Yeah, okay, so this is, this is dead bees in cells, usually with their head just emerging and their tongue hanging out. And this is a sign that things are getting pretty desperate. And this, is, this we use as the, uh, as, the, as the criterion for getting rid of a colony. If it's got any significant amount of PMS, we, that is the colony we're going to get rid of. And just a couple of pictures. There's, you've all seen this. There's a bees with the fallen wings. And here is a very mild case of parasitic mite syndrome. We've just got a patch of brood here uh, where we've got uncapped brood and where we here have a couple of bees with their head out of the cell. And if we pulled these out, we'd almost certainly find they'd also got deformed wings. So how do we interpret these signs? I said individual mites are rarely seen unless, unless there's little brood in the colony and nearly all the mites are phoretic or the population, the mite population is already out of control. 
and I'm sure you're aware of this, but um, these that are symptomatic with deformed wing virus are, are just the tip of the iceberg. Um, they are less than 5% of the bees that actually are carrying an infection of deformed wing virus. And the other thing about them is that uh, such bees do not survive long in the colony. They're, I'm not, not sure whether they die or whether they're chucked out by the other bees, but they have a very short, uh, uh, short lived presence in the colony. So when you see it, you are really underestimating, uh, again, what the size of the problem. I say undersized bees are a sign of malnutrition due to mite feeding. A PMS is the sign that the colony collapse is imminent and it's time to remove or eliminate the colony. Why aren't we monitoring the mite population? Um, this is something we considered doing. Uh, and of course, the accepted method of doing this is, is doing estimates of phoretic mites. Um, and you've, you've, you've had a lecture from Randy Oliver, I know, and you've probably been on his website and uh, you know that he, he, this has to be done several times to get accurate results. Uh, and this is fairly disruptive for the colony. Also, the best and easiest methods of doing this kill bees, which is either an alcohol wash or a detergent wash. We could use sugar roll uh, or get one of these uh, carbon dioxide anesthetization uh, systems, which are non-fatal. But the question is, do we really need to know this about the mite population when colony survival is actually the ultimate measure of success? Do we need to go to all this trouble to find the, mop the mite population? Um, if, you're, if you're doing selective breeding or something like that that Randy Oller is doing, then you do need to know. But if you're just doing straight natural selection, we don't see any point in, in doing, going to all this trouble and disturbing the colony unnecessarily. So right, I'm going to go quickly now for an annual report on our non-treatment apiary so far. Right. Uh, we try each year to do um, uh, a pre-winter inspection of our colonies, and I'll come for more of that later. Um, and in, in November 2017, we inspected our, our uh, we hadn't actually quite made up our minds it was going to be a non-treatment co colony, but we, we did an inspection and we re there was, that time there were seven colonies there and th three of them obviously had problems. One was just a small nuke and had signs of PMS. There was a full hive there, which definitely had quite serious PMS. And uh, another hive, which had no sign of recent brood and was, there should have been brood there and was assumed to be queenless. Uh, in, 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 in around the new year, just, just into 2018, we did actually oxalic acid uh, trickle treat these, these colonies. And it was only later we made the final decision that it was going to be uh, our non-treatment apiary. Right, so during the first year, yeah, our, our pre-winter inspection was borne out because there were only four colonies surviving. The three that we were suspicious about had all uh, died over the winter. So that was not a very auspicious start, really. But early in June, we had a nuke from a promising colony in a nearby apiary. Uh, and uh, we brought this in and, and got it established in a hive. And that boosted the number of colonies to five. Also two of the colonies uh, set up uh, to swarm and were duly artificially swarmed and we, we used a method with split board so we have colonies on top of each other. So we actually got uh, a couple of colonies raised from the colonies already got there. 
Uh, and for the whole season, we had really no signs of any problems in this apiary. There were no bees with deformed wings, no PMS. Um, in October, right at the end of the season, we actually recovered a colony from a long abandoned hive that somebody had found. I mean, it was, uh, it was we had to first of all, um, to get, <laughs> it had virtually rotted away and was covered in ivy. And I think it was only the ivy that was holding it together. We managed to recover this colony and it looked as though it had been around for some time. Um, Again, you can't be absolutely sure about these things. So the expected result with no problems in the first year was what we, sorry, what, what we would have expected, I guess. The second year, all six colonies we'd now got here um, came out of the winter in good condition. But it was, um, 2019 was a real swarming year with us. It was a very good season. We had the best season for honey we had for years, but it was also a swarming season. So virtually any colony that was um, worth its salt um, uh, had to go at swarming. Uh, and we, we've got, we've pretty well got, this is one of my specialities, swarm control. Um, and I've written stuff about this. And we managed, we actually, overall, all aphorists, we actually um, there were three colonies that uh, uh, beat us to the draw and actually managed to issue a swarm. And of these colonies, four of them successfully got a second queen, so thus we were, we'd made some increase out of it during the season. So early in the season, we started to uh, note undersized bees in colonies born virus, but only only one or two. Uh, Mid-season, all the colonies were seen with at least one bee with deformed wings in it. And one of the colonies ha repeatedly had quite a few bees like this. Um, and it, actually, this colony did actually develop a small patch of dead brood PMS, but it later recovered. When we got round to the autumn, we could find no bees with um, deformed wing virus and there was no PMS. Uh, and this was surprising because we really expected things to get worse as the season progressed mm -hmm. and the varroa population built up, but that didn't happen. Um, we also were able to add a seventh colony to the apiary in June. And that was a swarm out of somebody's chimney where the owner of the house claimed it had been living for six years. And he, again, you, you don't know whether that's correct or not, but uh, in all probability, there was some basis for it. So at the end of the season, all colonists looked healthier than the beginning of the season. And we found this very surprising. Okay, moving on to 2020. We went into the um, into the winter with eleven colonies in this apiary, and um, two colonies, two of these were on split boards, and uh, two of them were nukes that we'd made up during the season from one of the colonies, uh, and one colony had actually died during the winter. But we, it is one of these cases where the colony had actually taken absolutely ages to requeen, so we thought it wasn't going to requeen, and then eventually a queen came on lay. But we know from previous experience that queens that uh, suffer a delay of this sort are usually not good long-term queens, and that was that was borne out. This colony just put just the queen didn't lay enough and it just petered out over the winter. We had no reason to suppose this was um, a direct result of Varroa or deformed wing virus. I mean, it may have been indirectly, but it wasn't directly. It wasn't overwhelmed by mites or deformed wing virus. Uh, throughout the season, all the colonies have, see, see, have seemed healthy in and we, we had we had also moved surplus colonists to um, 
a second, an annex apiary about half a mile away. So we've got another apiary nearby and we moved some of the colonies there to, um, because there were not enough hive stands in that little apiary. And throughout the season, all the colonies in both apiaries seemed um, healthy. Uh, during the whole season, we only saw two bees with deformed wire virus, and there were very few undersized bees. None of the colonies actually, this was a low swarming year, and not uh, uh, the worst year for honey we've experienced in 30 years, I should add. Um, no colonies set up the swarm, but three successfully raised new queens for themselves by supersedia. Now, this was this the, the result. These very healthy colonies in their third summer was a very unexpected result, and we were left with the idea: was what on earth was going to happen this winter? Okay, I, at the end of the season, we actually, uh, the, the house that this, uh, the people who gave us room in this field to have this apiary moved, sold their house and the new people came in after, after hesitating about it for a bit, said they wanted the bees away. So we were very fortunate in finding a new site about a mile distance which is quite a large field, three, four acres uh, with good shelter. We think it's got reasonably good forage uh, and it would enable us to expand this at some time in the future. Uh, and we moved all eight colonies from this, this initial site to the new site in, in September. <coughs> Uh, and it, we actually added during this time our annex uh, apiary, we added another colony which we thought had some potential. So we're now just left uh, to see what's going to happen in the third winter, but I, I, have a, I have some breaking news for you in a minute. So that's our new apiary site um, uh, in November 19. Uh, 2020 with the eight colonies here. Um, so the summary to date is the outcome so far has been surprising and we have no real firm conclusions about where this is going and we're surprised that that uh, in the late summer uh, these colonies all seem if anything healthier than they'd started out. And that during those th these uh, two plus years, we'd only had one fully explainable colony loss. And this is considerably later than our treated apiaries, where we have lost a number of colonies during this same period. Um, we know other people have lost um, massive numbers of colonies um, in... Uh, through non-treatment and you have a beekeeper in in Texas who claims to have stopped treating a thousand colonies and lost it lost all but nine colonies um, there are there's a similar report from somebody in New Zealand I'm not sure they did very sensible things and they probably induced massive domino effect that uh, brought colonies down so we don't know will the crunch come this winter uh, the, the, is the, go the good result we've had so far, is it due to the good choice of colonies or is it uh, due to the so choice of our apiary site? And I'll, uh, I'll come on to apiary sites later. Or is it both? And basically, we don't have any idea why it's gone so well so far. Uh, I will just skip over. We, we really expected some colonies to get worse and some to die and we have to remove some. Uh, will this trend be continues? Are these colonies actually adapting in some way? Uh, the genetics has not changed. Um, one of the possible spec speculations is is epigenics evolved in some way? Uh, I don't know how many of you have heard of this it's a relatively new finding in science, epigenics. 
And epigenetics is where organisms um, are able to switch genes on or off. And this is in response to their living conditions, their environment, and it's usually the stresses. Uh, and this switching can also be passed on genetically. In other words, um, uh, an individual, when it reproduces, can pass the switching, the adaptive switching, on to its offspring. Um, so with a, with a bee colony, it's a bit complicated because there's only one reproductive individual, uh, the queen, and she really is, it leads a very sheltered life, is, is protected from virtually all the stresses. Um, and as I say, workers don't live long. So we don't, it's, it, it's possible the queen is involved, that she can have done some switching and is passing it on to the, her offspring. Um, um, another possibility is that we're no longer using miticides in these colonies, not, um, and do some of these miticides have some lethal effects? Uh, there's a lot of interest these days, and there's research going on about the microbiome of bees, the, their gut, flora and fauna. And it's known that healthy bees have a different biome from unhealthy ones. But uh, is this cause or effect? I mean, it's simply not known yet. Um, we use thymol, which actually is a fairly mild uh, disinfectant and could ingestion of this actually alter the uh, biome of the bees uh, adversely in the same way that us taking antibiotics disturbs our biome. Um, we have no answer to these questions. These are all possibilities that might have something. Now we've got some breaking news. As I told you, we, we try to do um, a pre-winter check of colonies. And this is usually done in November. We have to have uh, a, uh, an interlude of suitable weather. And uh, we had this suitable weather in, uh, on Friday and Saturday of last week. And we've been able to go through uh, all but about four of our colonies and basically we open the colony and see how many frames of brood they've got and whether they're queen right uh, at the same time we'll be checking on their food reserves for the winter it's all done quite quickly we, we, we can get through um, 20 colonies in half a day sort of thing it's quite quick um, so when we came to look at um, uh, our, our annex apiary, we immediately realized that uh, since they were last looked at, they developed a, uh, a problem. Um, one colony had numerous bees with deformed wings and had serious PMS. Um, and that will be, is now being eliminated from these colonies. Two other, there were four, four colonies in this apiary, two others had a number of bees that were symptomatic with um, deformed wing virus, but no obvious PMS. And we've left these alone and um, in the hope that we were, they will recover over the winter. Our recently added colony um, is almost certainly queenless and therefore um, is out of the out of the frame. Our new apiary has seems to have fared much better, and um, out of the eight colonies, we have just one colony with a few bees with deformed wing virus and what is possibly a small patch of PMS. And for the moment, we're just going to leave this alone and again, hope that um, this will recover over the winter. So that's the breaking news. So we at last are getting something, <laughs> something that looks like natural selection, which is what we expected when we started this. So that really ends the report on our own sort of um, uh, attempt at uh, 
getting resistance through natural selection. And I guess some of you guys have got much further than this and maybe when the question you told me about it. Uh, uh, so now I, I just, because I'm a scientist, I'm uh, interested in, in more than just, I'm interested in how these things work. And um, uh, I want to take a more, a wider, more holistic view of, of raw resistance. Uh, and uh, since 2018, I've delivered a talk to several beekeeping associations, and this is entitled The Honey Bee, Varroa and Default Wing Virus, A Three-Way Conflict. A better title, I think, would have been just one instead of conflict. And I'll show you the first slide out of this talk, uh, just to give you, to tell you what all this is about. In actual fact, we are mistaken in thinking about just about the honeybee uh, making the adjustment to, to, to this new uh, parasite, Varroa, because it's actually a three-way evolutionary battle or a, it's an ongoing process of adjustment. Uh, and, and it's a mistake to think about just the honeybee in this. Um, and you have to ask yourself, which of these organisms has the po potential to adapt quickest? In theory, the virus can replicate and undergo genetic change probably every few minutes. Um, uh, and next comes Varroa with a new generation every about every 21 days. So they are, they, they, their genetics can change quite quickly. And of course, the honeybee lags far behind this. And we don't usually have more than one genetic change a year. And it's our actions moving the honeybee around the world has created this new evolutionary situation and these these relationships have changed and uh, they just need time to adjust and of course it's in the interest of all three organisms to do this uh, but this will not happen if we continue to treat um, uh, so um, Obviously, bee, bre bee breeding isn't going to solve anything with um, the adaptation of the, the varroa mite and the fall wing virus. That's not affected at all by controlled bee breeding. There are a couple of terms which I'd like to bring to your attention, which are starting to be adopted in Europe. And this, this term, varroa resistance, varroa resistance refers only to the ability of the colony to restrict the growth of the mite population. But varroa tolerance is the more holistic thing and it refers to the fact that the colony is able to survive the combined effects of varroa and deformed wing virus without any need for external help. Uh, the honeybee can use, um, probably use multiple traits to control varroa. And despite what people say, we, we don't really know what these are. Uh, even if we did know, um, and there are multiple traits, then breeding bees for just one or two traits is difficult, and for multiple traits is actually impossible. So I think these, um, the people who are going to try and identify uh, the traits that are important and breed for them are... Uh, 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 I've got an impossible task. And of course, you're unable to breed varroa or, or defeating wing virus to be more amenable. And because of the complexity, natural selection of all three organisms is really the only possible route through to tolerance. Uh, there are signs that this is already happening. Uh, there are new strains, new strains of deformed wing virus have developed. Uh, um, some are thought to be more benign than others, but at the moment there appears to be um, uh, disagreement amongst the uh, people who study viruses as to which are more benign and in what way they're more benign. 
One of the interesting things is that before Varroa came along, um, uh, Varroa, Varroa, um, deformed wing virus was could be found in, in most hives, uh, but was um, not replicating, was producing no problems, and very rarely ever caused symptoms. And when the, that population was studied, it had a considerable degree of genetic diversity. There were lots of different strains present living together. It has now been noted in some areas where this has been going on some time that um, multiple strains are starting to reappear. Uh, whatever this means, I have no idea, but it, it is a return to something that more resembles how it was before we had the problem. This final thing is something I've been um, making inquiry with virologists about for several years because um, it was first mooted that um, deformed wing virus could replicate in a viral mite. It didn't just take in, passively take in uh, virus particles from uh, the bee it was feeding on. That they could actually replicate in the mite and then it was denied and there was ongoing research on this. Um, and it's actually, I've talked to virus, it's actually quite difficult to do to be sure that uh, uh, the virus is actually replicating in the varroa mite. Uh, but it has now been firmly established that it does uh, replicate in the mite itself. In other words, it's, um, it's invading the cells of the mite, which is what viruses do, and therefore this must have some physiological cost to the mite. Funnily, nobody seems interested in this, but I think it's uh, a very significant happening. And it is perfectly, you've probably heard uh, the old saying, the bite a bit. This is um, a nice example, I think, of the bite a bit, almost in a literal sense. Uh, so this may actually be serv serving to, um, it might, the cost to the varroa might may be that, um, I'm not saying it's necessarily fatal, but it may be a, um, a, a factor in their fertility. It may be a factor in how many, how many reproductive cycles they're able to um, complete before they die. We don't know at the minute, but there are, this latest research says that there are two strains of deformed wing virus that can only be found in the varroa mite. They're not found in the bee itself. Um, now, if that's true, that's a very interesting development. Varroa, uh, uh, several different strains and hap, 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 haplophytes have now been identified, but as yet nobody knows how their behavior differs. If, it, if in fact it does, it may not. They may just not, they may not have any selecting significance at all, but it's an interesting development. Right, now, finally, the honeybee. So under, under natural selection, uncapping and recapping behavior has increased. And this is the basis of the, sorry, it's supposed to be the basis of the varroa resistance of these colonies that have been studied in Europe. Um, but it's, it's really only a proxy for varroa resistance. And I'll explain what I mean by this in a minute. Uh, the honeybee, they're all, there are some signs that the bee's immune system is beginning to uh, deal better with deformed virus as it did pre varroa but I mean, this is really only anecdotal. Uh, we, have, we have certainly have colonies that seem to get deformed wing virus as soon as they have any varroa and other ones that don't, but it's, you know, that's not scientific evidence. Uh, one thing that has been established that um, looking at these resistant colonies on the continent um, and looking at the, the activation of genes in them, it has been uh, noted that genes that are related to their, their olfactory system, their ability to smell, it doesn't, does, 
they smell better. It doesn't mean they're using deodorants or anything. It means they're better able to detect what's going on inside the cells and identify cells that um, have been invaded with varroa. That, 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 that is a difference which shows between the resistance and non-resistant colonies in Europe. And that's again an interesting development. The question is, which of these three organizations will make the biggest contribution to tolerance? That's the ability of the bees to withstand, um, you know, the combined effects of all three organisms. And we don't know. And from the practical point of view, I'm not sure it matters. If you just want resistant bees, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Um, but probably all of these organisms need to change in order to create a, a stable long-term adjustment. And of course, the only possible way of doing this is through natural selection. So I keep banging this drum about natural selection, but it is only really the only feasible way forward. Just what do I mean by proxy? I mean, proxy means that um, uh, Uncaffing and caffing behavior is an indicator of resistance. And all the recent studies of these uh, resistant colonies in Europe show increased levels of uncaffing and recaffing behavior. This behavior exists in all races of honeybee that have so far been studied, uh, but often at a low level. And under natural selection, it increases. It's actually highest in the African races, which um, from the onset have really required no form of row control. And what, what is the common feature of all these resistant colonies is that they're able to limit their varroa population to about one third that of non-resistant colonies. And this appears to be a survivable level of of the mite population. However, at the moment, uncapping and recapping falls well short of a comprehensive, plausible explanation. It, they can't really say what is going on uh, with this capping and unpack capping, whether it, whether it kills mites, um, the, the, the daughter mites, it, it doesn't kill the adult mite. Um, but it may well, uh, the, um, the, uh, by dehydration, it may well kill the nymphs. It may prevent um, the daughter mites getting properly mated by the male. Um, at the moment, we don't know. And we don't know, don't know precisely how it is that uh, the uh, bees uh, uncap some cells and leave others alone. Uh, oh, but there is... A, there... Have another question on this? Yes, okay. Yeah. Um, do the bees actually, is it known whether the bees actually will like throw out some of the uncapped pupa? The, know, there maybe... is, the, that has a varroa sensitive hygiene, right? And that is, that is a factor in this, but not a major factor. But of course, uh, Varroa sensitive hygiene has the um, problem that it 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 kills that that pupa, right? It, but also, the parent mite nearly always escapes this, so the, the mite that's gone in there to breed will almost certainly escape to live another day. So uh, not only does it affect the con. The colony size for our sensitive hygiene, but it also allows that mite to have another go at reproduction. So it, it's not a particularly effective method. Um, these, be, these cells that are, are uncapped and recaptured, it can be done more than once, and sometimes they're even left uncapped, but the, 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 the pupa turns into an adult bee, normal adult bee in the end, and it doesn't affect the size of the colony population. This is supposed to be one of the plus sides for it. But there is, a, there is actually um, a hidden problem, which I don't understand why this has not been discussed in the literature. And it was a question I asked as soon as I read these articles. Does 
uncapping and recapping also apply to drones? Because it didn't actually say, it didn't say it did, it didn't say it didn't. And I actually had to go to a researcher and ask this question, does it, does uncapping and recapping apply to drones? And it doesn't. Drones are not treated in the same way as workers. And if any, I'm sure most of you have got a pretty good idea about the reasons for the exponential growth of the rural population in the hive. And that's entirely down to the higher success rate of breeding in, in drone brood. So with, if a colony doesn't have any drone brood, uh, the, it is unlikely that the, colon, the rural population will ever get out of control because it relies on the presence of drone brood to produce this exponential expansion. So I have no idea why this has not been um, discussed properly. It, it, there are only two explanations that I can see. is Either the researchers are ignorant about the way that the varroa population uh, increases in the colony or they're deliberately hiding the fact that this this isn't this uh, under appears to undermine the process well obviously it doesn't because the varroa population is much lower so something is working here to deal with this but at the moment we don't know what it is so i'm, I'm very interested to see what the outcome of this is um, there are different pathways for, uh, for evolution, pathways resistant. Uh, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that Ingham Fries and Tom Seeley's resistant colonies, which rely on small colony size and frequent uh, swarming, are, are following a different evolutionary pathway. In the UK, we have some people who claim that their colonies are resistant, and this is, this is through very active grooming. I knowing about the way that um, Varroa uh, 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 it has perfect camouflage, it has perfect cam chemical camouflage, I, I doubt that this is actually what is going on in these colonies, but who knows. Uh, uh, nothing rules out uh, them adopting, evolution adopting other pathways that we have yet not identified. Uh, and some of these other pathways may be more stable and successful in long term than others. It's just, just a matter of time before we find out. So now, this is another question. That I had never thought of this till I started to think about um, giving this talk to you. And intracolony genetic diversity is shown to be very important for all bee colonies. All their functions seem to be uh, improved by having good genetic diversity uh, in the colony. And this is to do something to do with the allocation of tasks and specializations and things like that. But um, some things have been um, uh, understood by now, but others haven't. So there was a sp specific study done in the UK uh, which showed, it was done actually by an American researcher who was on sabbatical uh, in this country, uh, and it was showed that just sheer genetic diversity affected the, um, the Varroa population in the hive. There was nothing here about selecting drones that had uh, resistant characteristics or anything like that, or even queens, they were just ordinary run of the mill queens but if the if it, it was done through with artificial insemination so it was known how many how many uh, um, drones they make with but with an increased number of increased patra lines in the colony the mite population was lower um, and this is not surprising since genetic uh, diversity is known to enhance the functions, most colony functions. But how this would work is not known. Um, uh, yeah. I think we can regard genetic diversity as being a sort of toolkit that a, a, a colony possesses. And my question is, who provides most of these tools? 
Is it the queen? But because it's potentially the drones. So when we're talking about breeding resistant queens, should all our concentration be just on the queens? If you take this idea to a logical conclusion, the drones are a very important factor in resistance. And this is just, just, a, this is just an idea for you to think about. If you were to bring a non-resistant virgin queen into an area where there are abundant resistant colonies and drones, on mating, would she become resistant? Conversely, if you take a resistant virgin queen to an area where there are no resistant colonies and she mates there, does she lose her resistance? And I think there is some evidence for this latter one because one of the things that has been noted uh, by several people is that when you remove, move resistant colonies to a new area, the resistance tends to be lost in this new location. And the most likely uh, reason why it is lost is because as the queen is replaced, uh, she, doesn't, she doesn't have access to drones with the right mix of genes. And it's just pure speculation, but it's something I need to think about. We need to think about because this does have an impact on the sighting of our apiaries in which we hold these columns and get our queens mated. Uh, uh, um, and we just don't know the relative importance of the genes provided by the queen compared with those of the drones. And this depends on the proportion of traits for resistance that are due to dominant genes as compared with recessive genes. What recessive genes need is they have to get the same gene from both parents for it to operate properly. Uh, many of the important traits may also be multi-genetic. Multi we don't really know this. Uh, uh, also, there's another subject that might be involved. Is there actually maternal dominance of genes? And this again borders on epigenetics. Does the, is the queen able to pass some traits on to her offspring? Okay, I can, my wife's reminding me of the time. I'm just coming to an end now. You'll be relieved to hear. Until this is better understood, I think we should play safe and only mate our queens in places where there's likely to be abundant drones carrying the right mix of genes. And feral colonies um, must be seen as an advantage and other beekeepers who are treating their colonies a disadvantage. We, want, we would want to avoid uh, the possibility of them meeting up with a significant number of drones from such colonies. Right, I'm going to finish at that point. I had thought of discussing some of the traits that could possibly compute to row resistance. Um, however, I think um, e enough is enough. I just want to make one point. Um, uh, a lot of attention has been paid in bee breeding to hygienic behavior. And this sounds like a, a really good idea, a banker, if you like, that it ought to be. These colonies, resistant colonies of Europe, in Europe do not support the idea that natural select, that uh, hygienic behavior is important. In amongst these colonies, there are a range of levels of hygienic behavior from low to high, and it does not appear to be connected at all with their resistance. And I take this as a salutary warning to us humans deciding what is important. Right, so we've got nothing now to do until next year to keep, keep our fingers crossed that uh, all goes well through the winter. Okay, that's me finished. Thank you for listening. I'll try and answer any questions if I can. If I can't, I'll say so. And I'll try and remain awake long enough. Well, Ollie, that's fantastic stuff. Uh, so you were saying that you're removing the colonies that are very infected. Um, yes. How, how are you removing them? Well, first of all, we're going to treat. Uh, uh, we're going to treat the, that colony that has got um, 
PMS that we are definitely taking out of things. We've already removed all, all its brood. Uh, um, we need to now intervene before the queen starts to, starts to get through to um, brood. It's only just, it's only just uh, what, three days, four days ago. So I need to get back there and I will um, either vaporize it with oxalic acid or um, can I get rid of this picture? It's a bit disconcerting. How do I get rid of that? Oh, you can yes. unshare your uh, screen. Stop share. Right. Okay. Now I can, I can see everybody. Right. Okay. That's better. Okay. So um, we're, we're, going, we're going to uh, treat it and uh, we will probably take it to one, another apiary where we're treating. Well, we, we hadn't yet. This only just happened. This literally is breaking news. So we're going to decide exactly how to deal with it. But it won't be in that vicinity next year. And it won't, if it survives, it won't be reducing drones there. And that, I think that's the important thing. It will be as though it has died. And that's what I think is important. Right. Do you? Right. Uh, what sort of questions do you want me to answer? I have a question if you have a moment. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So you best. mentioned one of, yeah, one of the criteria was for removal was PMS, but then I think in a later slide you said that you found a, you found a hive with PMS and left it there. I think that happened a couple of times. It, what, it, so it, it turns out it's a new mild. one. It was very mild PMS and um, occasionally you do, and it was also on um, uh, outside combs where uh, brood cooling could have been a factor. So it was not, it was not obvious enough to take it seriously. Obviously we're looking for it to reoccur. If it, if it really is, PMS, it's only going to get worse. So we don't know what it is, but I mean, the colony then completely recovered from this. I mean, this bad colony had, you know, each time we opened it had, um, we'd see perhaps half a dozen uh, workers with deformed wings. And uh, eventually then it had this small patch of dead brew. It was all oh, oh, right. This is, this looks like the, the beginning of the end, but then all the, the, the bees with deformed wing disappeared and the PMS disappeared and we kept the colony on. Um, it, if one of the colonies has subsequently requeened itself um, and the new queen has, has uh, built up a very good, uh, apparently healthy looking colony. So um, that's all I can really say. I, 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 you, you have to draw the line somewhere, and this is where we decided to draw the line. It may be right or wrong, I don't know. You seem to um, do a lot of, um, have your, a lot of your investigation based on visual perceptions of what's going on in the hive. Yes. And what, did, um, what would you say about the accuracy of um, how how that really is what's going on in the hive, in terms of percentage. Are you a hundred percent sure that you have um, assessed the um, the situation? Um, well, there's not. There's not what, I don't know of another way to assess it um, other than look at, look carefully at the hive and the state of the bees. Um, um, and am I sure they've done the right thing? No. Um, yeah. I, that in, indeed, in dealing with, you know, the amount of hives you're dealing with, um, it would seem that it would take an immeasurable amount of time should you double your, um, the number of your apiary, and hives in your apiary. Absolutely. Absolutely. And this is, this is not in pet, this is intended to be a project that will be adopted by our beekeeping association um, because it's a long-term issue. Uh, uh, I am a, a senior citizen. Um, put it that As way. am I. <laughs> and, uh, I. 
I won't necessarily be around or at least active <laughs> in, in beekeeping when this comes to fruition. Yes. So we have a number of people in our association who, who, who got, uh, we've got, we've got a, several medics in our association who've got a good scientific background who are interested in this sort of thing. And, um, we are, but for the pandemic, they would already been involved in the management of these colonies. But of course, that's just been impossible this year. Yes. But as soon as it becomes possible again, um, then we will involve them and together we will decide how this goes. Um, we have this one big site, uh, which is capable of expansion, uh, although we don't we in our area we don't have enough forage or enough suitable weather for them to gather forage to have too many colonies in one place we usually think about 12 colonies in one place is the sort of sensible limit to have so we would want to to have satellite apiaries it's a question of whether if you want to move this to another area i doubt uh, my, what I said about um, having the right drones in the area, we, I don't think you can just transplant one or two resistant colonies, if that's what we get in the end, to a new area and hope they will remain resistant. I, I think you've got to take a, a, a sufficient number to create a sort of a reproductive bubble, if you like, where they, the colonies you take there are actually producing a sufficient proportion of the drones that are available in order to keep uh, the resistance running. But these are things, these are just things, uh, you know, we don't know at the minute. I don't know how important the drones are. I'm just speculating that they are, could be very important. And everybody always thinks, oh, our breed queens, our breed queens, they're the ones that will carry the resistance. And I, I doubt that is true. So that really, really is the sort of philosophy behind this. And, and it's more about letting the bees select which queens they produce than uh, intervening ourselves. Well, we do that. I mean, when, when we do swarming, we allow, we allow the bees, we do it in such a way that we don't have to thin uh, queen cells ever. We make it so that the bees will, um, well, basically, it's, it's, it's making the colony think that it's actually in emer emergency requeening. And a colony that is undergoing emergency requeening has lose, entirely loses its impulse to swarm. And then they can make a choice out of all the cells they've got of the queen themselves. You know, the, these, um, these studies that have been done with observation hives, um, and particularly this, um, uh, what's he called? Stanley Schneider, have you come across his work? He's one of the Southern universities, Georgia, I think, or something like that. He, his, he and his students have done a lot of work on, on signaling inside colonies, particularly um, vibration signals and that sort of thing. Uh, and he has described the, the complex behavior that goes on uh, as soon as queen cells are starting to mature and um, uh, the occupants are probably starting to move within the cells. They're probably uh, starting to um, uh, produce pheromones. Then the bees show intense interest in them investigate them in particular they perform this vibration signal on them uh, and that's presumably to elicit some information back from the occupant not really known but it becomes it does this behavior it does become obvious that um, some of the queens are going to be culled by the bees themselves and it becomes obvious which these are going to be. It doesn't actually tell you which is, who's going to be the ultimate inheritor of the colony, but it, it narrows it down to um, um, you know, a, 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 a fairly small group of, of screen cells. It um, sounds like that's incompatible with grafting. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> There's actually some, I came, while I was researching this, I came across a very interesting new article 
uh, that's just appeared, I think it's published last year, I think, which is actually dis discovered that when the queen lays an egg in a queen cup or queen cell, it is a larger egg than she lays for workers, right? Now that to me, it, it's an interesting, and this, this, uh, this apparent advantage, however it works, it is, is, is carried right the way through and such colonies uh, produce uh, queens that develop in this way, turn out to be a larger queen. Um, grafting, I think you are doing the, the, the worst of all worlds because you're doing the selection. And there's another very interesting paper around showing that when a colony is um, making emergency queens, which is how we make all our queens through emergency, not grafting, they actually take a lot of trouble selecting what larvae they're going to uh, promote to queen status. And this is based on their actual nutritional status at the time, how well they've been fed with royal jelly in this initial period. So they take a lot of care. And that's something as a grafter you can't possibly know. So I think of all the, th of all the options, this, the grafting is probably the least uh, sensible one. But that's only my opinion. Hey, Wally, I have a question. Thank you so much for your, um, your talk Hi. tonight. Um, so some of us have been uh, doing like uh, splits and then going in four days later and culling the, um, culling the cells that are capped on day four, thinking that the larvae is more, uh, more farther along and probably didn't get um, the best nutrition. Um, and so some of us have been taking out day four capped larvae thinking those will be inferior because they weren't really fed right for the longest period of time. What do you think about that? I think this is baseless. Um, I think when, when a colony becomes queen and has to raise, raise emergency queens, it does the very best job that it can possibly do. Um, uh, if it has the resources to do it, a lot, there's a lot of prejudice, particularly, I don't know how it is in America, but there's a lot of prejudice in this country against emergency queens because they say all sorts of things like the colony won't be able to feed them properly, uh, they'll, they'll promote larvae that are too old to make a proper queen. Uh, 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 all the scientific evidence is that they just don't do that at all that they choose the correct larvae and providing they've got the resources uh, in terms of food, pollen and, and honey, and the young bees and an ongoing stream of young bees, nurse bees, that they make a damn good job of it. And after all, you are using it, when, when you graft into cells, you are, you are not using the swarming impulse to raise queens, you are putting that those grafted cells into a queenless colony and they are started off under the emergency requeening impulse. It's just exactly the same as you do if you let the, let the bees do it themselves without, without um, furnishing the cells. So I, I see no problem in this. I have discussed it, this with one or two people and, and uh, they also agree this is, this is almost certainly how it is. What we have in this country is we have beekeepers who haven't looked at their colonies for two months. They get through to August and they probably take their honey and they look at the colony. Oh my God, this colony hasn't got a queen. It hasn't, it hasn't had brood for weeks. They stick a frame with eggs in and then they expect a bunch of old age pensioners to make a decent queen. And she doesn't, she makes a makes a scrub queen because that's all they're capable of. So uh, this is this is this is what I think this is what this suspicion of emergency queen is based on. Because we I'll all we get all our queens, virtually all our queens, uh, with this emergency procedures. And when we make up nukes, 
we ensure that all nukes have multiple queen cells in them uh, from which they can choose their own queen. And we, we, will, we have given up to 18 different queen cells to a nuke to let them choose their own. And we have an absolute minimum of two queen cells when we're we, we we just split we split colonies the queenless part and and the, most of the brood goes with the queenless part and the queen is left to rebuild it's also doubles up a swarm control because the 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 old queen has now got masses of new space to lay and most of the brood has been removed and that is a colony which has all eight the young bees and the oncoming young bees. We make sure it's got plenty of food to make good queen cells. And all we do, we don't actually cut out queen cells or anything. We harvest whole, whole, frames, whole frames with queen cells on them to, to um, furnish our nukes. And these nukes are always furnished with the bees from that colony. So that the bee, we don't know whether, it, whether it's important or not, those queens are actually being raised by their own sisters, not a foreign bunch of bees, but their own sisters. Hmm. Now, we don't know whether this is really important or not, but we think it's- Smell might be important. We think it is, and we don't, we don't, we never use mini nukes, because this is a colony of bees that it, right, trying to, trying to raise and get a queen mated uh, which is far smaller than would ever occur in nature. The smallest cast swarm, or as you call them, after swarm, is never that small as one of these, these mini nukes. We think that's a bad way. Um, people who use mini nukes reckon if they get 60 or 70% success rate with them, they're doing well. We expect to get close on 100%. Over the last uh, 11 years of making nukes this way, 95% of these nukes have initially raised a queen who wait, lays worker brood. We get the odd one who will lay drone brood. Um, it's very, very rare that we ever get a queen lost during this, these mating flights. Um, they nearly all seem to get back home all right. And so we think we must be doing the right thing. Wally, I have a question also. Um, thank you very much, by the way, for uh, doing the presentation. I very much enjoyed it. Um, but you mentioned uh, about uh, increased patrol lines seem to have a lower instance of varroa. Um, you know, in our area, uh, we had a meeting a little while ago where people were talking about their queens only lasting maybe six or seven months and then getting superseded. So I'm, I'm wondering if that might be because of uh, maybe insufficient mating, you know, not good mating, and then having, if they're not mating very well, then they're gonna have a lower number of patrolines. So, you know, that maybe oh. by treating, we are uh, causing it to get worse. You know? um. That's, that's, that's what people usually blame these incidents with queens, early supersedure is, is traditionally blamed on bad mating. Um, before Varroa came along, this happened rarely. Um, and um, I don't think the weather has changed so significantly. I mean, we get pretty shocking weather here and yet our queens uh, mate, they just have to wait until there's an interlude in the weather and then they get themselves mated. Um, it is my own view that virtually all of this is down to virus infections. And we have actually, what often happens with these ones that replace the queen early, early in her life is that they never do make a success. And we think in these cases, we actually, there is vertical transmission of viruses. In other words, the queen can lay eggs or use semen that contains virus particles so that her offspring start off with uh, an infection. And we have had colonies that appear to have 
the queen survives and functions enough, even with an infection of deformed wing virus, but we are pretty certain that she is able to pass this on to her offspring through vertical transmission. I mean, it's, it's established that vertical transmission occurs. Um, and we think it's part of the story. We don't think drones, uh, drones who carry deformed wing virus have been shown not to be at any disadvantage when it comes to the competition for mating, which is how they, this is how these queens get this um, sexually transmitted disease. Um, and they, they, they doesn't, being able to, they seem able to be able to fly and they have a, a long enough lifespan uh, to, you know, to do their business. Um, so we don't, we don't think that is the cause, but other people would disagree with that and say that, the, that mating is at fault. Um, people, people who do um, artificial insemination get drones and uh, they uh, extract semen from them and find that it's not viable. And they think this is part of the cause again what you've got to remember, a queen um, mates with multiple drones, so she's got, she'll have, she maybe have semen from drones that haven't got viable sperm. But you have to remember that the, um, the sperma seeker is not, is only populated by, um, by sperm that could actually swim into it. So it's automatically selecting against uh, non-viable sperm. So again, that's a very difficult one to to believe. That's part of the picture. Um, you know, um, ninety five percent of the sperm that a queen collects during her mating flights just goes to waste. It just it just is pumped out gradually past the entrance to a spermatheca, and sp sperm migrate into it if they have the ability to do so. Presumably, there's some sort of uh, chemical trail that they follow to do this and most of it is is ejected and cleaned up by her attendant workers mm. so I find it difficult to believe so one takeaway I think I I get is that if we do the normal sort of uh, swarm management splitting we're doing just exactly the right thing f for uh, natural selection as long as we don't uh, try and over exploit the uh, queen cells. We let the bees select from yes. more cells. Yes. This is what we, we think. Um, we, have an, we have an interesting technique that you might be interested in. Um, and we, we, we invented it for ourselves, but we have met other people who use this technique. Um, when you've got a colony that's uh, Swarmed. You've missed. You've missed. You've missed. The, you've missed the moment, and it, it's actually swarmed. You have then got a colony with a lot of queen cells, and if you don't do something about it, that colony will produce an after swarm. Right? Correct. So the usual recommendation is to go in there and thin the and look at the queen cells and say, "Ah, oh, well, this this is the best queen cell they've got here." we'll thin this down to one queen cell. And in doing this, you have to be careful that uh, it isn't so, so soon after swarming that there are there's still brood there, which they can make some more cells out of because um, when you thin queen cells, it often induces them to, to uh, make more emergency queen cells if they've got the wherewithal to do it. So you, you either have to, um, it, then it, it, you either have to do it a little bit later when there's no brood left to make queen cells or you have to go back in and check they haven't made some more. But you think that that is the recommendation. Now, we don't do that. We, we look at the maturity of the queen cells there and we will actually open one or two just to find out what sort of stage of development they are, how near queen emergence they are. And we will work out um, the day in which some of these queens are likely to emerge. And um, you can err on the um, 
uh, uh, on the side of of some of them already having emerged because when virgin queens emerge, the early virgin queens that emerge are not capable of flight uh, immediately. They, they have to get their, their thorax uh, cuticle properly hardened up before their wings work properly. So there's, there's reckoned to be something between two and four days before after a virgin queens emerge before a cast swarm emerges. So you want to catch the beginning of that period when most of the queen cells are mature. You then go in there and with a, a, a sharp scalpel, you, you flip off the end of the queen cells and let the virgin queens emerge into the colony. And you, you go through all the queen cells there. Uh, any that are immature, you destroy. Any that contain a ready to emerge queen, you just let the queen walk into the colony, right? And then you, you carefully examine all frames to make sure there are no reserved queen cells hidden away anywhere. And then you just leave the colony with these multiple queens in mm. it to sort it out. And we have um, emerged 18 queens into a colony that already probably had several virgin queens anyway running around. And they, by some means or other, they choose one of these queens um, and do so without, it's, and they've never ever attempted to swarm. Uh, if they've got no, res if they've got, if they can't detect they've got any reserve queen cells, then that immediately kills the idea that they can swarm. They will just sort out what they've got. And we have one of our one of the one of the one of the beekeepers we taught has upstaged us on this one. He's actually released 26 virgin queens into a colony. And it works perfectly. And we actually uh, our our um, our regional bee inspector who is a small time commercial beekeeper as well has used this for a number of years. And when we told him about, about it, he said, oh, yes, I'll, I'll use that. When, I, when I've got the time to, to get there on the right day, um, this is what I do. And this, I think it's a better way than, than deciding on one queen cell. I mean, I, I've actually been in somebody's colony who's not a very good beekeeper and you, you wanted to give him the safe option. And uh, um, I looked at the queen cells and narrowed it down to two queen cells and said, well, these are probably the most likely queen cells to produce a queen. And so I, I, I better destroy one. He doesn't want to cast swarm. So I destroyed one, got a dead queen inside it. <laughs> and the other one was perfectly all right and produced a new queen for him. But I mean, I, I, just, I just got lucky. Simple as that. There are dead queens in some of these, mm -hmm. some of these cells you own cat, you find that the, the queen is actually dead inside the cell. Mm -hmm. It may look perfectly good from the outside, but the occupant's dead. So that's what we I, do anyway. In our area, I think it's pretty much, um, well, it's, well, I'm just not widely accepted, but it's fairly widely accepted that if you don't thin your queen cells out, you're going to get uh, subsequent swarms off of it, and you could eventually have your hive swarm itself to death. And that hap have has it's happened at least twice this year, though. Oh I'm yes, yeah, 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 yeah. That's what, that's what will happen. Yes, and people say that feral colonies don't. They say that um, that after swarming is is down to beekeepers making larger colonies, and that uh, feral colonies uh, don't cast swarm. They jolly well do. We, we know of, of a feral colonies that have issued cast swarms. And they're, they're, they're sometimes tiny little things. Even, even the prime swarm is, is you, would, you would say, well, this is a cast swarm until you put it into a hive and the queen starts to lay within a day or two. And mm -hmm. you know then there's no time for her to got mated. This is one of the ways that we are, identify what we think are are uh, colonies that have had some survival in the wild. Yeah, I mean, and it's saying, the way we artificially swarm to avoid this problem, there's actually, um, you, could, you could go, you're interested in this particularly, you could go to the 
um, WK website. Um, just just Google WBKA, and um, I think it's uh, under library. And there, uh, there is a booklet on called an Apiary Guide to Swar Swarm Control. Interestingly enough, it is thought that queens raised from the youngest possible egg are, are um, more attractive. And yet they're going to be the ones that um, emerge the latest. So the earlier ones were, were laid, you know, at a different time and are seen to be in popular view, um, maybe not as good. Uh, the study on this that I, uh, there's, there is, I can't, I can't, can't give you the reference off the top of my head, but this has been looked into and they've looked at the size of queens that come from different aged larvae. Uh, well, no, they start with eggs and larvae. The, qu the largest queens come from newly hatched larvae being adopted. Mm -hmm. And that the ones that are selected later from eggs that hatch later are generally slightly smaller. They're still functional queens, but they're actually slightly smaller than the ones that are adopted first from newly hatched larvae. And, and um, the, go, I'm sorry. And that it is very, very rare for them to um, adopt a larva that is too old to turn into a queen, that she will only become a part queen. Um, it's very rare for that to happen. And of course, if you leave the bees to, to sort out the, which queen they're going to have, they're obviously going to realize that uh, they've got, they're smarter than we are, they're going to realize this, this is not going to be a good queen. Yes. Thank you. And All indeed, you to them, is... they'll do, give them the chance. They'll, they'll trust the bees. They, they know better than we do. We're so arrogant as human beings. This is what I call uh, uh, anthropocentric beekeeping. And uh, what we call, we call it, I've written some articles on this, which is the principles of apicentric beekeeping, where you let the bees do make most of the decisions and also you put them in situations that they understand because beekeepers often put colonies in situations that they would never um, encounter in nature yes. and they really have no built-in solutions they, they have a series of built-in solutions and they, they're able to c collect the necessary evidence to decide what they do next but beekeepers, particularly with, with swarm control, put, put colonies in a situation they simply don't understand. And they're not, the, the bees are intelligent in a sort of collective way, but the, the, they have not got innovative intelligence, put yes. it that way. Yes, a charming, a charming talk. Thank you so much. Okay. But, well, Wally, you mentioned uh, at one time that um, you identified multiple strains of uh, deformed wing virus. And uh, I was curious how you differentiated between the strains. I mean, I have no idea how you would do that. Strains of what? Sorry. Deformed wing virus. <clears throat> oh, 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 this is, I don't do this. I don't do this. This is done by the, by the virus specialists who who, who, who look at the DNA of these viruses. Oh, so it's the DNA we, analysis. It's, it's all these strains. I mean, every time you look at the disease, there are, uh, look, at, look at the DNA profiling of them, you find there are multiple strains. In Britain, we, of European fowl brood, uh, we now have something, something over 20 different strains of European fowl brood, oh. Lysipopus pluton, right? Um, we don't, we, we can actually recognize that some of these have actually been imported because they're the, the endemic one in other countries. We don't know how most of them have arisen at all, but the boy, and the sa exactly the same, they're, they're, they've also been studying the different strains of American fowl brood, and there are different strains of those. And certainly with the European fowl brood, um, they have different levels of pathogenicity. They, they, some of them are quite mild. They don't normally kill a colony. The other ones will kill a colony very quickly. 
So it's a, some kind of a genetic analysis that they do. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is not within my capability. When we okay, wanted just, to know whether... You mentioned it, I was just like, can you see it? Or I, I didn't quite understand how you identified that there were multiple... No, like, no, I mean, we're entirely reliant on all this. I mean, I have, um, I have good relations with people working in our national B unit. I see. Okay. Uh, and uh, if it's in... If they can justify it, they will. They will look at. They will look at things for us. You know. Oh, okay. Okay. So we sort of work hand in glove. Unfortunately, our B unit politics again. Our B unit has just been privatised. Right. Oh. So, so instead of in see, instead of um, being run on government money, it now has to earn its money in the open market. It, that, that is. That brings me to another question I have, and you know, this whole deal of selection by letting things die, we call that out here, we call it the bond method of live and let die. But, uh, yeah. but anyway, um, I was just wondering how, I don't think that that's a viable solution for a commercial operator, you know, you can't- No. Get, yeah, so I don't, I don't know how you, how would you introduce something like that to a commercial outfit? I have no idea. And I mean, you are very, you are much more difficult than us because you have mass production of queens, right. um, usually in the southern states because that's where it can be done more economically, um, and there are all sorts of problems arising from that. Um, that our uh, we had a vert, we have a national honey show in Britain, and it. it it, I, I'm not interested in showing honey, but they invite some very good speakers to come, to, to come along to this. And this year it had to be a virtual one. And one of the speakers was your Jeff Pettis. You know his name, do you? I do know. Right, well, he's the man who is, is looking into your queen problems, the fact that uh, they don't survive very long um, and uh, they have all sorts of problems. And um, he was really, he has got round to a position where he's really um, slamming the mass production of queens by these big breeders and, and advising what we, the policy we adopted in Wales as, a, uh, as an association, which we try and get our associations to adopt, that we are self-sufficient for production of queens and that these queens are bred locally and I do mean locally we only want to breed from queens that have lived on the Isle of Anglesey and are adapted for its rather peculiar weather uh, we don't really want to get queen don't really want to get genetic material from elsewhere and that should be that evidence is that should be adapt that should be adopted locally so how this could possibly um, be used by commercial beekeepers, I have no idea. But um, all I'm saying is that uh, hobby beekeepers, or what you call backyard beekeepers, are possibly the ones who've got to lead the way into the future. I mean, we still, we, we ridiculously still have commercial beekeepers who take colonies out to Italy to get queens bred from them early in the year and then re-import them. Now, how silly is that? So we have a situation in our area, the situation is that where uh, people, uh, we have no control over what people buy as far as queens. No, no. Yeah, so I mean, people are gonna bring in queens from everywhere, yeah. we have no control over that. What we've done, what we, we've tried to do in Wales is to, we're trying to make Wales completely self-sufficient for bees and um, in this in this quest we actually have the support of our devolved government, Welsh government, who have actually some early, uh, early on um, I wrote a booklet called Simple Methods of Making Increase, which is just the very most basic form of queen raising that you, you split colonies in order to get new queens. Um, and um, the idea is that if you 
I mean, we, we had we have beekeepers in our own association who've been beekeeping for 30 years. They've never deliberately made a queen for themselves. They've relied on their colonies swarming or somebody else's swarming to, to get their queens. They've never actually said, I'd like to breed a queen from this colony. And this is this this booklet, which again is on our on the WK website, promotes a, a very simple method which anybody uh, can adopt for making making a new colonist for themselves out of their own the best of their own stock, right? Uh, and um, what with it, with our training program in Anglesey Beekeepers, we will we we sell them a nuke. After they've done their initial trading and done a lot of bee handling, in, in usually at the beginning of July, we sell them a five frame nuke, a really good five frame nuke that's just just wanting to go, just reach the stage where it needs to go into a full hive. Uh, we sell them that, and then it is their job to get that through the first winter. In the we don't introduce them to all the complicated things about um making queens or swarm control or anything in their first year. They just have to learn to handle bees, uh, be able to take a colony to pieces, understand what they're seeing and roughly what it means. Um, and then the second year, we will not sell them another nuke of bees. We say, you must make this, set. if you want a second colony, make it for yourself. And we guide them through that process. And they often, yeah, off part of this guidance is um, is often helping us to make the next generation of nukes for the association. So they have a, a practical example and good instructions, and virtually all of them are successful at the first attempt. And um, this this gives them a skill for life. They can they can they can then go go ahead in beekeeping. Okay, they, they've got a friend who's got some nice bees. They can. They can get some um, eggs from them or something like that and, and diversify their colonies. But they understand the basis of how this is done and they can do it in a very simple way. They don't have to do grafting or artificial insemination, all these complicated things that most people have absolutely no aspirations to do. So that's, yeah. our, that, that's been our policy. I pretty much do. Uh... I'm, I'm in agreement on that. I, I, I found that uh, the people who learn how, that learning how to make bees is a big step forward. Absolutely. Essential. And I, I uh, there's several people that I've been working with trying to get them to that level of being able to make bees. Because mm -hmm. uh, I think it relieves them of the, uh, it relieves the threat of losing your bees over the winter. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Well, you have to go. You have to go in into the winter with some reserve colonies. Uh, we had one re the winter of, of um, uh, uh, twenty twelve thirteen. We lost sixty five percent of our colonies over the winter, and we we did come to a, an explanation for this. We had uh, uh, an absolutely appalling late summer and autumn. Uh, and um, we think the root cause of this was the inability of the bees to get sufficient supplies of pollen to make strong, healthy winter bees. Because winter bees have a totally different diet from summer bees. They have a protein, high protein diet, which develops their fat bodies and all that sort of thing, gives them longevity. Um, and what, what we found, and um, our local bee inspector backs this up, that beekeepers who had just one or two colonies in their apiary were perfectly all right. They came through the winter perfectly all right. There were no losses. But anybody who had multiple colonies in their apiary, uh, they lost a proportion of them hmm. and we put this down to the fact that the weather was so poor that the range over which the bees could forage for pollen was restricted and that when there were a number of colonies competing 
for what resources there were, um, they just didn't get enough. So they didn't get the right winter bees to survive. And they, they were okay and they petered out. We had, a, we had a, a, a protracted spring when there wasn't much available for them. But I think the die was cast back in the autumn. If we had known and fed uh, pollen substitutes and things, we, it might have saved today. But it, it's not a thing we do. It's, it's coming in in Britain now, but it's not a thing we've ever done is to feed um, pollen substitutes or, or any, any additional form of protein because the type of bee we have here in Wales, the, um, the northern dark bee, is an incredible collector of pollen. In fact, it is quite often in the, in the spring we actually have to remove pollen uh, frames that are 80% filled with pollen just to allow the brood nest to expand. They over collect uh, pollen. Uh, I mean, they over collect from our point of view, probably not from their point of view. It, it's suitable for them. And we'll, we'll put, we'll, we will put these frames aside and we'll use them to put into nukes and things like that to give them a good source of pollen. We try not to waste it, but um, it is, but this one year this happened and we're sure that's the explanation of it because the bee inspector went around a number or goes around all the aphids and he said, it's, it's, it's the same all over. He said, if there are a number of colonies there in the aphid, they've lost some, but if they've only got one or two, they're, they're fine. So I think a case could be made for uh, the, a positive aspect of bringing uh, queens in from outside and that is to add to the genetic diversity of your group. Um, you know, if you are uh, solely raising from within your group, you've limited yourself to this particular uh, genome, right? Or this particular uh, set of genes that you have in that group at the time you cut it off from the outside world. And so if what you're looking for isn't in that group, you're never gonna find it. Whereas if you are bringing in genes from outside, it's possible that you could find it. But you have such a harsh climate where you are that bees from outside of the area might not make it. Well, that's true, but you also have, you don't, you don't have a toy, you don't have a chance at getting to there if you don't have that genetic uh, um, a, a, you know, a foundation of where you can find that gene that you're looking for, or that series of genes. Mm. My suspicion is that lack of diversity is a myth. Uh, it's only a thing that, uh, that humans can create themselves by, by breeding um, masses of queens from just one breeder queen. And then if they are widely dispersed, it doesn't do any harm. If they go all over the place, it doesn't do any harm. But if they're kept in the same locality, then you are um, um, it, you are c cutting into diversity and uh, I'm totally against people who who have mating, a isolated mating apiaries where they supply the colonies that will produce the drones they think are going to be good for mating and they, they all, if that's done repeatedly uh, that can decrease diversity, but when you take when you take the queens that are bred in these isolated out into the real world outside, the, in the next generation they say whoopee and go and mate with anybody they feel like, <laughs> and you you've got you, you you've a job to, you've a job to retain lack of diversity, which is often what bee breeders want to do. They want all the colonies to perform exactly the same. Right. They don't. I mean, our colonies here, here on Anglesey, uh, we have, because we get such changeable weathers, we have colonies that have all sorts of different seasonal timing. Some colonies will come up early uh, and be useful if there's a spring flow. Um, some of them will come up late and these all coexist. Uh, and because some years it's an advantage to come up early and some years it isn't. So this diversity is, is self-retaining if you don't interfere with it. So I, 
we've, we've got some offshore islands in Scotland where they've had bees that have been isolated for decades and they are not suffering from lack of diversity, that's for sure. They manage well, that. Well, I, I don't know. I think, uh, you know, if you look at genetic history, I mean, I, I, I'm not one that really, I, I'm not a geneticist by any means. Just kind of no, a citizen. I'm not either. <laughs> <laughs> but I, when I, you, know, you, you look at some of the things that have happened where you have these genetically isolated or these isolated populations, and and then uh, you know you, you they introduce some other species in there and they just get ran over because they they you know they don't have whatever it takes to fill those other niches. Yeah. So, um, hey Wally, I have one more question. Um, it's about when would you consider, say you have a outside bee. Okay, so we're in California. A lot of people buy Randy Oliver's bees from Grass Valley and bring them into the Bay Area. Yeah. What point, turning over queens every year, does that genetic in that hive become a local hive? Don't know don't know really um it's difficult to say we've speculated on this how many years does it take to become a locally adapted bee um i think in our sort of area where there's a fairly harsh climate it happens quite quickly um we at one time along the north wales coast we had uh, someone who had um done some beekeeping in new zealand and was much enthused by their their New Zealand um, Italian queens uh, and imported some to North Wales uh, and people people took this on board and bought these queens off him and and they were they were they were selected out so quickly they just disappeared from view they they suffered from tracheal mites they suffered from the zima uh, uh, the, the, they were the sort of colonies that um, had to be fed in the middle of the season if the weather was bad, uh, and th they were quickly eliminated. Um, we have people who just want to breed pure black bees, and I also disagree with that. I'm prepared in our colonies to accept genes from absolutely any race of bee at all, as long as it's adaptive. In other words, it increases survival and health. So we do not, we, when, we, we, when we select our colonists for breeding, we almost certain, almost always use a queen who is actually in her third season. So she was, she was um, produced one season. Next season, she is running a full colony and we get a, a clear idea of what she is, how healthy she is, and what sort of size colony she produces, how much honey she produces. And then in her third year, we will use her as a breeder queen. But we, will, we, we have never ever raised more than nine queens from one breeder queen. And normally it is just, it is just two to four. We will have a number of breeder queens uh, that we make our nukes out of, and we will only make a small number of nukes out of them. Because again, we want to retain genetic diversity. We don't want to put all our eggs in one basket and say, this is the best queen. We will breed all our colonists from this. I think that again is a mistake. So I don't know. I mean, if you've got a constant influx of of material from outside, I don't think you will ever get to a locally adapted bee. We're just fortunate where we, we live, and also quite a lot of areas in Wales are the same, but um, down, down the Welsh border with England, there are quite a lot of commercial beekeepers, and I think they're in, they're in a very difficult position to, 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 to develop anything that resembles a locally adapted bee. So uh, um, I talked to Miles Spivak about this, about, about open mating. And in her area in, in uh, Minnesota, they just have so many bees coming in during the summer, they can't do any open mating at all and expect to get a predictable result because there are, there are drones from all over the bloody place, all over, all over them for their, their 
they're open mated queens, so they can't really open mate queens at all. Steve Shepard uh, from uh, University of Wisconsin showed a slide at one of the Davis Bee Symposiums and it uh, had a spot in it from uh, the East Coast Queens and another spot in it from the West Coast Queens. And he noted that about 300 to 350 mother queens uh, produced um, millions, basically, of commercial queens. Right. Yeah. I mean, this, uh, we, we spent quite a bit of time in New Zealand, and um, the first bee that went to New Zealand was the Northern Dark Bee. Uh, and later, they, dis they decided that they would do much better with Italian bees, right? So they, they imported Italian strains of bees, and then they, they've uh, bred, their, bred up from, from those sources. Uh, and in North Island, New Zealand, it, it is Italian bee isn't 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 um, badly suited to the climate, but it, it is giving them all sorts of problems because the colonies go through the winter very large. Not only do they uh, need an enormous amount of feeding to get them through the winter, uh, they can get the the varroa control well get varroa well under control using chemicals in the autumn by the time they've got back to the spring again the colony's been set bre bre breeding over the winter and the varroa levels are back to critical again they have to treat again um but what what in particularly in south island new zealand where the climate as you go particularly as you go further south gets well it, right in the south, it's very similar to here, it is in Wales. Um, um, they, they still insist on having these uh, Italian bred bees, but they are clearly poorly adapted because they, they quite often produce a lot of brood and then the weather turns and the brood dies uh, because they just have just over, overreached themselves. But in the wild, the feral colonies, and particularly in the forested areas, the native forest areas, there were, the time we went there, and we're talking about 2007, 209, we were, we were there. Um, in these areas, there were feral bees, and they were black bees. We would accept them quite happily as being a, a, an authentic black bee. And they did not appear to be being genetically introduced by the the, the, the mass of Italian bees. In fact, it was the other way around. These black bees tended to mate with the Italian bees. And some beekeepers welcomed this and said, well, these sort of bees that have got some black bee in them uh, are better foragers. They forage under in cooler weather. Uh, however, it did have a somewhat adverse effect on their behavior. They were bees that uh, needed you need protection to, to handle them, whereas the, the classic uh, Italian bee in New Zealand, you can go to uh, with, um, without smoke and with no, no protective equipment at all, and you, you, they won't attempt to sting you. They're, they're like flies. I find I find that highly unnatural. A, a bee a bee has um, resources it needs to guard, and it should be able to do it in a vigorous way. So we we don't accept overtly uh, uh, aggressive bees, but we expect our bee, bees here to be defensive. Um, and Jeff Pettis was one of his points in his lecture that the, the first priority in breeding bees seemed to be that they were my, you know, they, they were very um, non-defensive. Well, and he thought that was a stupid thing. It's certainly not a thing we use. We, we have three, three criteria that we use for choosing our colonies. The first is healthy, the second is healthy, and the third is healthy, right? <laughs> this, is what, this is the first thing we think about. When we when we select a colony to be a breeder queen, it has to have a few other characteristics. But um, we don't. We gen, for some reason we seem to have uh, 
we don't seem to have much a problem with. We have some bees that uh, can be tricky on the day, but um, mostly they're, 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 they're easy enough to handle. Urban beekeepers uh, can't really have bees that are too defensive. Yeah, yeah. We have this trouble with urban beekeeping. And urban beekeeping is, you're always, the, the powers that be recommend that they, that they buy bees, non-aggressive strains of bee. And uh, that has increased greatly over the last few years with this sort of save the bee sort of uh, impulse with people, save the bee, save the planet. And uh, it's producing quite a problem. Um, uh, it's producing a problem for the bee inspection service. It's producing a, uh, uh, a disease problem in some cases, and uh, certainly a forage crisis in some areas where there simply isn't the forage to support this number of colonies. So it'll find its own level in the end. There are parts of uh, North Oakland and Berkeley where you can uh, look in yards in a block radius and find 12 different hives in eight different yards. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I came in on your discussion about uh, you having a discussion about the, the rules and regulations about how many how hives you can have on a plot of land. And uh, yeah, yeah. Wally, you mentioned a, a booklet you uh, wrote or a book or a booklet that you wrote on studying or increasing your hives. And do you have a title for that or where is it available? Uh, sorry, on swarming is this? Was so it? Is, no, I thought it was on on splitting. You had uh, you wrote a little book that you teach people how to increase Greg, their hives. Greg, there are some links in the chat. Go look at the links in the chat. Okay. Right. Other, right okay. Okay. I mean, the um, the books that I've written six books uh, booklets. They are. I mean, they're okay. sort of about thirty pages or something like that. Uh, on various topics for wealth beekeepers and they were they are published well the first two were actually published for us by the Welsh government but we've since done second editions of those anyway so there are six booklets on what are thought to be topics that uh, beekeepers uh, want specific information about and they they are all available to download free of charge from the WK website some of them, and particularly the one um, about uh, swarm, swarm, swarm control, really requires to be downloaded in colour because it's got colour-coded diagrams in it. Uh, they are also republished by a firm in Britain called Northern Bee Books who have republished them, and they are available from them. Um, uh, the latest one is not is as they haven't republished that yet but it's probably one you wouldn't be interested in it's just on feeding bees that's not a job. That's last a... link i posted into the chat is to the uh, welsh beekeepers association oh, library it has uh, all, all of the uh, i think uh, booklets that wally mentioned oh Thanks. right okay mm -hmm. they're written by a beekeeper for beekeepers and I don't write about anything I haven't done. I don't lift stuff out of books and regurgitate them in print. We, we, between us, we've done all these things. Hello? Well, uh, it looks like we may have exhausted our group and you as well. I suspect, I'd, I'd like to I, thank you I suspect I'm getting near my end now. <laughs> Thank you very much for um, okay, Jerry. coming up with us for the hour and a half session. Uh, I'm really glad you invited me to do this. Um, because um, it's given me the chance to think about these things more closely. Yeah. Well, we've been discussing a lot of these items and so it's uh, great to hear someone who has uh, put a lot of these things to practice. So it's uh, giving us for a lot of room for thought. So we have a, a group called the yes. Local Bee Initiative. And uh, needless to say, we will be re referencing you a lot um, uh, next uh, Monday night on the 23rd 
when we uh, all get together to discuss uh, what we're going to do for next spring. Right. And you all get together virtually, I presume, at the moment. Uh, yeah. We yeah, do. yeah, yeah. We're, we're, we've got a resurgence of COVID-19 in this country. And, well, well um, uh, we're both in the in both both in the uh, uh, in the uh, risk group of uh, with age and so on. Although neither of us have any underlying disease, it's still age is um, puts us in the risk, risk factor. Group. Hmm? Risk factor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, we are are self isolating, which we we don't mind too much. It, it's only really our kids we can't see and uh, at this time. So. That's so beekeepers thing. on Anglesey don't uh, go over to Wales and bring uh, bees or colonies back to Anglesey and vice versa? And do They have products? done. They have done. The la Anglesey has got the best record for notifiable de bee disease in the whole country. And the notifiable bee diseases are the usual two American and European fowl brood, right? We have, we've had one case in the last 45 years we had one case of European fowl brood, and that was a colony that had just been brought in by somebody. And that's all we've had in all that time. So if we don't, we, we, we're very sort of naive about these notifiable diseases because we just haven't had them. And for some reason, um, our National Bee Unit did um, what they call a random survey a random survey of, of the bees in England and Wales. Scotland's rather different, they, they work independently from us, but they did this random apiary survey at which they went along to um, random apiaries and we, we had a couple of apiaries I think in this survey um, and they took samples and they screened them for all the disease organisms that they were able to screen them for, absolutely everything. And one of the odd things that we do not understand is that uh, the disease organism for European, European fowl brood does not appear to exist here in northwest Wales. None of the colonies was it found. Other parts of the country, there are always some colonies that show they have the organism, but they may not have actually um, clinical disease the time but they have this organism present we don't have it present in this area and we have no idea why we have absolutely no idea why this is oh, one of the diseases you didn't mention was chalk brood we have a problem with that ah. uh, we do have an ongoing problem with that and um, we don't really have any um, explanation for this um, we obviously select, we breed from colonies that have little or no chalk brood, but they don't always come true. Um, uh, we, don't, we don't know how much it is environmental. Um, it's one of these diseases that hasn't been um, researched very much. We, suspect but don't know that we might have a different strain of the organism here in this part of Wales because if you if you go down the North Wales coast towards Liverpool it sort of peters out. We had, we had beekeepers there who've not seen chalk brood and we can't really believe it's different bees. I think it must, I think it, it, it seems more likely to be a different strain of the organism. We, we can keep on top of it. We're, we're, getting our, we're gradually getting our colonies better uh, from this. Um, but it is an ongoing, it's an ongoing minor problem. So you have uh, genuine winter bees and, and we kind of don't because uh, our bees are foraging all winter long. Um, ours, ours, ours will I mean, um, uh, yes, yesterday I was out with bees and they were bringing in pollen by the bucket load. Oh. And it was um, 12 degrees centigrade. So it, it doesn't snow much on Anglesey? Uh, or on our bit, no. With our kids, we only had enough snow to make a snowman twice in their young life. So that tells you 
that. And even then, it, it was quite difficult to find enough snow to make a respectable sized snowman. If we wanted to go to Bogganing, we had to go across the mountains. So yes, it, but we, we are actually in an extremely frost sense, a frost, frosty area of the island. And we, we are on a, on a little bit of topography where cold air pools and this year on May the 5th we have a we had a devastating frost that only lasted a few hours and it almost totally wiped out our apple crop the plum, plum profit wiped out completely apple almost completely and we had native trees like ash that had their leading shoots killed to the height of 20 feet wow it was a real cracker. We don't know what the temperature was, but it, 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 it just, just, just very short lived. I, w I went out at about 11 o'clock at night and ice was just starting to form on the roof of cars. And we thought, oh, well, not too long till dawn, is it? You know, it probably won't get too bad. And then we got up the next morning and this had happened. So, yes. So that, that's the, it, it, our, our main problem is wind. And we live three miles from the open ocean. And when there's been heavy weather, we have streaks of salt running down our windows. That's the sort of climate it is. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. We're so, it's just, it's just how many people are left? I haven't looked. Oh, there's there's 19 left. Uh, we peaked oh, right. okay. at close oh. to 70. Thank you so you much, Wally. Nothing, you mean you've got nothing better to do? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so shall, shall I leave now, Jerry? Uh, you may. Thank you again. Okay. Um, um, Thank you. I will keep in contact. I'll let you know how this goes. Um, and uh, if I've got anything else to offer... Um, down the road, I will we'll be happy to talk to you all a bunch again, yeah? Great. Uh, perhaps uh, another check-in next year? Well, probably next year is a bit early. Okay. I'd like to have a bit more experience under my belt. Um, I mean... As if 33 years isn't enough. Well, no, I meant, I meant of non-treatment. Right. I'm sorry talking about where non-treatment goes. I'll talk about other subjects, but which have had 33 years experience, but uh, it, it's, it's very, it's, it's a kind of completely novice at, um, at non-treatment, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, good night, everybody. And you can say good morning to good me. Good morning. Good morning to you. Okay. <laughs> right. Cheers. Thank you very much. Thank Great. you. Great.